The following podcast contains adult language and themes that may be unsuitable for some listeners. You've been warned. Why, hello again, friends, and welcome to the very first bonus episode of the award-winning season two of the Going There podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a very timely topic, which is cannabis. Uh, we're going to be talking about the history of it, the stigma, the public perception, the legality of it, and we're going to bust some of the old myths that we were taught in school. And before we get into it, I'm a man you rarely ever see pray or beg, but I'm going to do it now. I am praying and begging for those of you, you listeners, you viewers, to share this, to help us grow this podcast. We want to see us go into a season three. And the only way to do that is to make sure that we get more support from our viewers and listeners by sharing it, by subscribing, by telling your friends about it, by writing us a review, giving us a rating, whatever you can do, that helps helps us expand our, our viewership and our listenership. And that's huge. But those of you who have already been doing it, thank you so much. And the awards that we've been winning so far are just as much yours as they are ours. So thank you for being a support. And with no further ado, let's get into it. Why there is such a need for weed. Ready or not, we are going there. Taboo Topics are back on the table. All right, so let's go ahead and introduce today's guest to talk about this topic. Hello, my name is Dr. Bridget Cole-Williams. I am a family physician by trade, as well as a medical cannabis specialist in Ohio, as well as in Michigan. And I do education and um, outreach to allow this um, medicinal option to be more available to sick patients. So you were originally a, essentially a primary care physician. People are coming to you going like, Hey, what about weed? Or what about using cannabis to like get better? Right. Right. So that's pretty much how it happened. Um, I definitely grew up with a bias against it to say the least, you know, um, anything that I had seen or experienced kind of told me it was a bad thing. And, uh, you know, in the course of being a family physician, I spent most of my career at the Cleveland Clinic. I had, I, I was also someone that believed that patients should have options that make sense to them. And I was actually helping a lot of patients do more lifestyle change to get off of medications. One of those patients asked me about cannabis. I thought she was crazy. And so I was really just pulling information together to help explain why this was a bad idea. In the course of it, I saw that there was medical research going on really around the world at that time, and that um, this was something that for some reason I had no knowledge of. And I had a lot of faith in my patient, diabetic, new, you know, breast cancer patient. And I followed her in her journey and I saw cannabis do something very different than my pharmaceutical patients. You're talking about why you were so against it uh, at the beginning. And that's not because uh necessarily you're a cynic or you're a judgmental person that's something that's very much bred into us early on uh we all know about like reefer madness what is now a comedy was a psa that said look at all the horrible things that happen if you or someone you know is is on drugs is on weed and they're going to murder people and they're going to go nuts and there's the psa of the talking dog and the girl's like i'm so high my dog's talking to me first of all terrible marketing because then i'm like i want to smoke weed after i saw the dog talking and everything. so <laughs> Maybe that was some people did you know <laughs> yeah. like this is amazing <laughs> you know as you've been in your journey and talking to people and and as you went into that research what did you find about the propaganda the misleading propaganda against it this is the thing that really got me when i when i started realizing that this was a real medical option it honestly made me start questioning a lot of things that I had a natural, natural bias against. I, I assume that somewhere along the line, like you said, you learned something that you set an opinion on. And it's so that it really started having me look at um, our medical options differently and really focusing on hearing what my patients needs were. 
But um, I, I realized, number one, I realized that the best way to influence people is to create fear. And Reefer Madness was a great fear campaign for, for most, right? Um, and they did these huge, I mean, it literally is comedic now, but at that time they were creating these really exaggerated, just false aspects of what cannabis would do. At the same time, it was being given to people every day from their pharmacist, right? Because Cannabis was very much a part of a great majority of the medications that at that time period of time, we didn't have synthetic medications and pills and all this. Right. So pharmacists were actually doing compound pharmacy in their stores, creating combinations of medications. And while we're telling people it's scary and it's horrible and, you know, you're going to jump out the window, your pharmacist, you know, the doctor and your pharmacist was giving it to people as medication. Of course, that slowly went away because of the propaganda, but we really had a medical option from the very beginning. And fear and greed is what allowed us to get into a space of prohibition. So let's talk about what drove it though, because you know, there's always some kind of agenda behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not just, this is bad and we don't want people to be happy. As much as we want to think these evil people, it's always about the almighty dollar somewhere right. in there, right? So. You had, I think, the two big proponents behind it, pushing it from the get go were the mm -hmm. tobacco industry, because mm -hmm. marijuana was going to cut into their profits. And mm -hmm. of course, the good guys over at Big Pharma, they're such sweet people, and they really just didn't want people to get hurt on it. Right. Is there anybody right. else other than probably some of the uh, moral majority, too? Right. A right. little bit of that, because of if they're told it's horrible. However, study after study i'm being joined by a dog so this is already oh, my nice. favorite recording ever study after study after study shows that alcohol is far more dangerous and Gosh. and the effects and and look i enjoy alcohol i have no problem with it but it needs to be done in moderation right and for a lot of people it's a huge huge problem a huge yes. problem right and yes. destroys communities destroys families you know um <laughs> It, we, we've been put in a situation where we have been given s such directed information, you know, because it does benefit somebody else. As, as everything that you laid out, the pharmaceutical companies were creating synthetic medications at the same time, did not want to compete with um, cannabis because it was, it was a medication. Um, you know, Ann Slinger, who was running, you know, an aspect of the government that was um, looking at the prohibition of alcohol, actually was close to losing his job because that didn't work. He previously had said that uh, there was no problem with um, cannabis whatsoever. But when alcohol's um, prohibition started to fail, he was like, oh, geez, I'm about to lose my job. I failed at this. You know, I've got to do something. And then he started to turn with the help of, of the big businesses that you mentioned, he was he started to turn to uh, say cannabis was the the culprit, right? So I want to I want to pause real quick just for our listeners, those of you who don't know. So Harry Anslinger is one of the huge figureheads behind uh, this propaganda. Uh, he was the he was the top of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics through five mm -hmm. different presidents' administrations like you said, when, when this was failing, it was like, okay, we need, you know, in all politics, we need a bad guy. And, and he wrote marijuana assassin of youth, mm -hmm. um, which mimicked a lot of the reefer madness stuff. And uh, he was kind of the, the face of the anti marijuana was. movement right. uh, for a long time. But previously had made it very clear that, you know, they had things that were, um, tea baggers and there were like little jazz clubs and clubs that had cannabis and no one had a problem with it whatsoever. And even when you say that as far as like social or religious groups, there were the, uh, I think it was the teetotalers that were a group of women that uh, would say, you know, alcohol is bad and to refrain. And, you know, they were very stringent in their beliefs. What people don't know is that that group of women 
yes, they were anti-alcohol, but they were actually pro-cannabis. And the reason was because to be direct, their husbands would come home drunk on alcohol and physically abuse them. But that didn't happen when their husbands used cannabis. So they their whole campaign was no, you know, decrease alcohol, increase cannabis, because we don't have those problems when our husbands use cannabis, right? And so, yeah, there there was a social movement, but not not quite what people expect. It, it's a very odd history in America that spread outside America. You know, as we became deeper and deeper into our prohibition, um, Mexico burned fields and fields and fields of cannabis because they grabbed a hold of what we were doing as well, and we created a culture. That again, you cause fear and it's spread across the, the world. And then honestly, we're just slowly coming back from that. And we lost a great medicinal option and a lot years of research because of that greed and because of that fear. And I hope, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping as we go state by state and hopefully federally at some point is to catch up to get the research because we've created a lot of medications, some that do great and some that barely hit the mark. And cannabis is something that was doing great things when we knew even very little. And if we could learn more, we have um, something that we could really help a lot of people with a lot of conditions with less addiction and death. Right. And that's a huge factor is, is the addiction element. So Let's myth bust a little bit more and then okay. we'll get into kind of uh, some of the things that you found through research. Data mm -hmm. is important. And without mm -hmm. that, it's all hearsay and it's all, you know, it's just people using fear tactics. So so the data that we learned, I would say the first half of my life was a lot of it is a gateway drug. So mm -hmm. if you're on this in no time, you're going to be smoking crack. Mm -hmm. It is something that destroys a human being. They, the the woman who deflates on the couch. You're not even a person anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that is going to make you uh, go out and drive and kill people, right? You're going to have this sudden desire to do that. You're going to uh, become psychotic and want to murder people. And, and keep in mind, I, I want to make sure the listener hears, these are the myths. These are not the truth. Yeah, these are myths, right? Each one of those we can go through and, and, um, share, you know, why these aren't true. You know, a lot of people believe you just become stupid, you know, and, and lose motivation. And, and that's not what we've seen. A lot of our most creative people and, uh, you know, leaders have used cannabis as a part of their process sometimes. And some of the most, you know, motivated people I know, cannabis is a part of their life right? Some people still think it causes cancer, lung cancer, which also is not, you know, a truth in itself. Um, it, most people, all, well, let me also be clear. I, cause I'm thinking about things that patients have said to me. Um, also I've heard that there is no addiction and that is also not true. Okay. And, and the one thing that I, that's important to me as an educator, and I taught at Cleveland School of Cannabis. I have taught honestly across the country at different conferences and schools um, that we, I want a balanced truth to come out, right? That there's a lot of negative myths, um, but if, if you think cannabis cures everything is the best thing ever and has no um, downside, then we're not really being, uh, supportive either something like that does not exist in this life because Nothing. think no, about absolutely. it water you can die from drinking you too can much die water. from water and and so i'm not saying this as a negative i'm saying no, it as a reality as a reality you are better off utilizing this for a number of conditions as opposed to some of the more addictive life-threatening pharmaceuticals yep. and sometimes it just plain works better you know and it's unfortunate that even in medical states, it's seen and, and regarded as an alternative once you have failed all other medications. But in reality, it should be right lined up there and sometimes the first option for patients um, when looking at 
pain conditions. It should be a regular part of a cancer regimen. You know, um, it should be a great option for anxiety. Again, avoiding some more addiction, um, addictive medications that can cause more harm. So I hate the fact that it is seen as the alternative when, like I said, initially it was a part of a regular uh, medication regimen, you know, back in the thirties and forties. And, uh, and, and so we need to really kind of put it back in a trifle place. And so let's talk uh, for a minute just about the addictive uh, qualities of it, because it's not that it's not addictive at all, mm -hmm. but from a lot of the studies and things that I've read, it does not have the same addictive characteristics as other drugs, as alcohol, as, you know, all of these things. You, as humans, we have addictive personalities, but there are things that physically cause this stronger addiction. So um, the addiction or dependency with cannabis is about 9%, which is the same as my coffee. And I might be mean to you if I don't have my coffee. You know what I mean? So um, I'm glad you're drinking coffee. Thank you for joining us with it. But um, and as more states go uh, medical and recreational, some of that dependency rate has increased because Honestly, we have released programs with a lack of education um, to the public. But in reality, we're not talking about um, strong addiction that has people strung out, that has them stealing money out of their mother's purse or anything of the like. Where yeah. it, we're, we're That's like a very um, intensive, addictive um, qualities that cause harm. OK, people develop a dependency often with cannabis and a very few people have addiction where they simply cannot function. But that's rare. Right. But people will um, have an unhealthy dependency occasionally. And um, that's why it's important to talk about tolerance breaks and to be uh, aware of why are you using it? Are you using it to relax? Are you using it to help your body or are you using it to escape? Right. right? And if, and if escape is your focus and you're doing that all day, that's an issue. It doesn't matter. Keep in mind gambling, um, shopping, um, the, you know, things that are benign to others can be an addiction for some. I hate to, I hate to admit this again, because I say it often on this podcast, but sugar, sugar. you will take the oh. sugar out of my dead hands before you ever get it away from me. Yeah. But it is one of those things where, it's like I have to catch myself and go, I've had way too much sugar this week. I yeah. need to like go cold turkey for a little bit. Um, but sugar is far more addictive than marijuana. It is. Um, yeah, sugar is in that there's a whole long story about our relationship to sugar and how and we corn syrup created and a culture again that cannot do without it in so many ways, right? Yep. Um, and you know, I hope that we become more humane and create a more healthy culture because a lot of the things that we're talking about have been placed into our media to to draw in the consumer. And without the education of this might not be for you, right? And just having like a little tagline like this might cause problems. Well, we we need more balance. We need more education overall so that people can make choices and identify when that choice might be going in a negative, you know, direction. So, you know, to remind people, and I think we've talked about this in the past about media and, and marketing, but, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right? Mm -hmm. That was, that was marketing. That wasn't doctors coming together and saying, you need to eat a large square meal for breakfast. Oh, and by the way, make sure to have Kellogg's cornflakes. Right. Exactly. Um, so, so a lot of that stuff that we've learned, we we've assumed was facts and coming from the medical professionals. Even like culturally, um, we have this belief that you have to have the engagement ring and the diamonds wedding. are a girl's best friend. That, that's just Mark. Like, but once you have that in mind, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm not someone right. that is a skeptic on at well, a little bit, but not on every level. Healthy right? skepticism is great. But once you realize what you've accepted culturally was really not even cultural, but just a um, advertising campaign to, I mean, okay, we're in Ohio, sweetest day. Advertising campaign. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, it does make you kind of say we should be picking and choosing what we participate in a little bit more. Yeah. Um, as a, in the more information you have, you can, you know, make better choices. Yeah. And, and I agree with what you're saying. So, you know, we're not conspiracy theorists whatsoever, but because something is a conspiracy doesn't mean it's untrue. <laughs> you know, these are actual conspiracies, not theories any longer. It's been right. proven that these things have happened. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that so much that is um, ingrained in your cultural understanding of the world that you live in, Mm -hmm. are marketing ploys from a company to make money off of you, it it does get a little disenchanting and you're like, oh shit. You know, I, I always thought that Sweetest Day was important. It was a long lived tradition in my family. It was like, nah, that dude down the street trying to sell candy. So yeah, that's it. That's all. That's it. I, and I didn't even realize that until I literally, I was in college and I met someone from Massachusetts and I said something about, oh, Sweetest Day. And they, he just had this blank look. And I'm like, yeah, it's a holiday. No clue. And then realizing it, that it was simply a campaign that hit like the Midwest. And I guess we fell for it. Well, we do love our sweets. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was. And we, we like a good card too. We like a, like a little sentiment. You know? I think we, I think we fell for it like openly and honestly. And we were like, oh, sounds great. You know, we were part of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as you, as people are coming to you and you start doing the research, mm -hmm. um, what's a little bit of what you found? What are some of the studies? Um, what are some of the things that you found in your own research, like actually running some trials and putting people on medications that was surprising to you? Just the vast um, possibilities of cannabis still blows my mind. And I think, you know, I, I come from the point of view where, yeah, I, I, I didn't think cannabis did anything but get you high and knowing that there's over a hundred cannabinoids and we're just on the brink of just understanding just a few of them. Um, knowing I was like, I will say I was a big skeptic when it came to like essential oils, you know, I had, my kids were in school and, you know, if I was at a school function and a mom said, and if I said I had a headache, I had someone with a case and they were like, put pepper and oil on you. And, blah, and I was like, Whoa, what's going on? And so I kind of was a skeptic with essential oils, but basically knowing that terpenes that are in the cannabis plant are the essence of what essential oils are and the medicinal benefits of that alone, it made me look at holistic medicine in a much, like we're missing the boat, you know? And I think, again, that I think we, I, as a practitioner, I think um, I've been taught to look at holistic options as less than where in reality we just they just don't have the same funding as pharmaceutical companies for research but there are a lot of scammy holistic oh, there are. Yeah. people and medicine so and and i know you know that and i want to make sure people are clear because what we're talking about isn't you know we're not just talking to somebody who's like i like weed and i read some stuff and weed's good you are an actual doctor who was prescribing all kinds of medications for years were against weed Mm -hmm. But it was the data and the evidence that actually changed your opinion. Absolutely. And so that doesn't mean, like you said, that healthy skepticism, that doesn't mean go into every witch doctor who's like, no, man, I'm going to spiritually heal you with some essential oils and some smoke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, there are a lot of phony things and scammy things out there because yeah. people I mean, the biggest way to make a buck on someone is through their health. And it's yeah. so sad that that happens. But. But with cannabis, the evidence is there. It was there for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're realizing what other countries were doing, you know, Israel was top of the top notch when it came to, you know, uh, cannabis research and the information that we've gained um, from them has been just incredibly remarkable. And like I said, as we gain more legalization, we will gain more research, right? Because it's hard to do research on an illegal plant. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm actually excited to see what the next 10, 15 years really look like in this space. But um, to see how well it helps PTS, you know, people that have difficult diagnoses to treat and seeing what it does for them. So there's something called um, endocan um, endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And so this is where we're assuming that either it's a receptor that's 
not working well, that there's not enough of them, but there's a group of diagnoses that are incredibly difficult to treat in medicine. And they have found that by using particularly CBD that repairs receptors, that we're actually able to treat these conditions in ways that we have really failed before. So that includes um, certain types of migraines, um, fibromyalgia, um, irritable bowel, and some forms of PTSD. And so when these patients are given um, CBD, they actually, you see improvement that you haven't been able to see with other pharmaceuticals. That was a big one for me because I'm a family physician. I see a lot of fibromyalgia. I see, you know, my, like, this is my wheelhouse and I've struggled at times trying to help people get over these conditions. And I, there was some research that was going on to actually do like a, uh, um, receptor level and, um, a natural, our natural endocannabinoid level, which might be playing a part into it. And if we can get that information, this puts, um, cannabis on a whole nother level, because these are p- conditions that people just struggle with their entire lives. Um, but I will tell you though, I've had patients where I'm trying to come up with the next plan. And they come in crying, not because they're not well, because it's the first time they've been out of pain in decades. That's impressive. That's significant. And so, uh, you know, I'm hoping for just more of that information to develop. The reason that this episode is so timely is because Ohio is about to vote on issue two um, at the state level, which would legalize recreational marijuana. It's Mm -hmm. already been legal to have medical marijuana, which I think is the most important thing is that you have access to it if you need it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of states are kind of moving in that way. There are some states we may, who may never see it and it's really sad. Um, But uh, when it comes to the idea of a recreational use, um, it's always a spectrum. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Do you see that as a powerful thing? Do you, because not everyone can get a medical card, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Right. What are your opinions on that? So I feel like if I want to grow tomatoes, you know, doles should tell, shouldn't tell me I can't or whoever. And so I feel that people should have access to this. It's, it needs to be regulated to a certain extent, of course, but then on another level, we, we need to undo the propaganda and the prohibition that we've created. Right. And so I think we're going to be going through years of balance. And to be honest, we look at Canada that has made it federally legal and they still are going through all sorts of different levels of balance. And how do we um, make this a safe option, a medicinal option, a recreational option all at the same time? Right. Um, But I yeah, the this is what we've created is a little bit out of control. Um, I always pause when they say regulate it like alcohol, um, because cannabis is much more than alcohol. Um, but to say that you should be 21 and above, I agree with, unless you have a medical card, um, to say, you know, we make it, more decriminalized, absolutely necessary. Yes. Uh, to say that you should be able to grow a couple plants of your own. I don't see a problem with, to be honest, most people don't even do that good when they, <laughs> Yeah. you got to know what you're doing a little bit to grow it well, right? Uh, what I am concerned about is that when you go recreational, a lot of the more medicinal options on the shelves disappear. And so things that are higher in CBD or CBN or CBG, or, you know, just more, uh, cannabinoid focused, uh, options kind of go to the wayside and just high THC options, um, are made simply because they're more profitable and they sell more of them. So they don't just make as many. Some of them will have a medical license and a recreational license. A lot of the growers and processors will actually get rid of their medical license because there's more money in recreational. That is my concern because at the end of the day, we um, have created these programs on the backs of patients 
And those patients do not disappear just because recreational comes on the market. And so that's always a concern of mine in our last book that we just uh, published, Courage and Cannabis, where we bring people together to share their stories um, that we have uh, available on Amazon. My um, submission for that is being medical in a recreational space and how can, what happens to that patient, right? When they can't find their medications that they were previously using, when some of them try to utilize some of the rec medications, but it doesn't work as well. And a lot of them disappear and just go back to their pharmaceuticals, which is unfortunate because they don't have the support of knowledgeable um, cannabis specialists. And, it, you know, I have a lot of family in Michigan and I've seen their progression over time. And it bothers me that sick patients get uh, dismissed and uh, pushed away in a recreational space. So if we can make better education, outward education, so the medical patient can still thrive, that's probably what's most important to me. That's that's a great answer. And I appreciate you sharing that. That's wonderful insight. And it's true. This isn't a, well, now everything goes because again, going full circle, the profits are still going to be at the core of this. You know, it, it should help the economy and that's fantastic mm -hmm. but we can't lose sight of why this is important in the first place mm -hmm. and you're mentioning some of those cbd um uh, products being you know overshadowed and taken away because of the thc right now as of right now it, i would say in general in the u.s let's say um you can get cbd just about anywhere mm -hmm. uh what's the quality of that cbd that's readily available and and how might that change in the future uh with, depending on how the vote goes, yes or no. Sure. So, I mean, it kind of depends on the state and, and lab testing, but if you're buying your CBD from the gas station or most recently I saw at the shoe store, which kind of threw me a little bit. Well, if your shoes um, suck, you might as well be comfortable in them. Yeah, I guess so. Right. Um, that is probably not your best option. Like you definitely want to get recommendations. You want to go to knowledgeable CBD stores or resources because I've been in CBD stores, they have no idea what they're selling. And I've also been to CBD stores where they're mixing stuff in the back room. Ooh. So be conscious of that, okay? Uh, when I say that we need to have CBD and some of these other cannabinoids in dispensaries where they sell THC is because CBD does it, it is more effective when there's THC involved, so full spectrum. So for my medicinal company, Green Harvest Health, like we work, and I ended up getting into space because I had patients, I had two people come to me um, that said, gee, the CBD thing doesn't work. And I looked at what they had and they had olive oil and caffeine. There was no CBD in the product that they had. And so I got into the space so that I could be aware create products, know the lab testing for patients. Full spectrum is a great option where there's um, less than 0.3% THC in it, but you need to see the lab testing because a lot of CBD stores don't even sell full spectrum because it's harder to, because um, it requires more lab testing to do it, right? But dispensaries where people are going and there's a variety of options and there, there is more THC options, do need to have CBD as one of the options that they carry as well. And when they let go of that, they're missing the boat of a lot of patients that never want to be high, right? Like I deal with an older population when CBD and THC are equal in concentration, it blocks the euphoric effect. I like to think when I'm driving down the street during the day, that everybody is not high is what I like to think. And, or when you're at your job that you're able to use this as an option, not high, um, because that's not gonna work for most jobs. And if, when we let go of that, we lose some of um, the medicinal opportunities for people. I'm, I'm glad you brought those two things up because I, I wanted to speak up to those specifically for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the data suggests that uh, places that have legalized it, crime has gone down. When you think about drugs not being run by our cartel and and CD, you know, back alley deliveries, um, it's safer. Uh, it's it's 
being subsidized. It, 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 it actually adds to the uh, community. There's funding. People are buying it anyway. Might as well go towards schools and roads and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who are against it, and look, if you're against it, I'm not going to judge you for that. Uh, everybody has their own opinion. But there's a lot of, again, uh, I it's hard to call it complete disinformation, but it's, it's uh, erroneous calculations. So what they said is ever since in, in certain studies in areas, like I think there was one study, it was either in Michigan or Colorado. Mm -hmm. And they said after recreational use went up, there were more and more uh, car accidents that were uh, that were being calculated and, and the person had uh, marijuana in their system and workplace injuries went up and people had marijuana. However, that test is not accurate because what they're saying is it was in their system, not the cause of it. And mm -hmm. if you especially if you're a, a, a casual marijuana user or somebody who's using it more frequently, it could be in your system up to 30 days, maybe even more, depending on your system. So mm -hmm. finding it in your system and saying this person was it basically all it proved was more people are smoking weed <laughs> legally. Mm -hmm. It didn't mm -hmm. prove that weed was causing this where right. there are exact direct correlations between workplace uh, accidents and driving accidents on pharmaceutical legal mm -hmm. medications uh, overusing them on over-the-counter medications overusing them and of course on alcohol mm -hmm. so they're they're getting a lot of pushback finally we're seeing the truth and the data kind of overwhelm these people are coming out and saying no 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 this is still bad it's like no and the violent crimes this guy had weed in the system well, it doesn't sure. mean anything it, means it doesn't mean anything at all it's inconclusive at best yeah and if anything until we have better testing um, we really won't have great data when it comes to that because we don't have testing that really shares that someone is um intoxicated at that right. time, right? And I can't believe that we can't get that together. Like uh there 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 has to be an active metabolite that decreases after the euphoric effect um goes away. So, you know, we'll see what the future holds for us. I, do you think that that's medically possible? I have to imagine it is the potency level so. in your, in you your know, blood system. I just, um, you know, I don't have any data to support that, but in my imagination for everything that we learn, you cannot tell me that there is not some sort of metabolite that is only active during the euphoric experience and resolves afterwards. Or at least something that says it, you're past that point. You know, power. like that was something that would have taken place a minimum of 36 hours ago. Exactly. And I, I'm hoping that, I mean, the more research will get there. And I, I, I just can't imagine that's not there. Other, you know, otherwise we're, we're, we're going to have problems for a long time. But the, the fact of the matter is like, even what, what you're sharing as far as like the crime or the, the driving, what, a lot of states have seen like in the very beginning when a, when a state opens their medical programs or what have you, there's a slight bump up in driving um, accidents because there are people that don't know what they're doing. It goes down and then honestly, accidents actually go continue to go down because people are using cannabis, they're drinking less alcohol. And when they're drinking less alcohol, that definitely leads to less accidents, right? So there might be a little bit of a bump up in the beginning, but it ends up um, calming down. And uh, people, the, the fact of the matter is people that use more cannabis use less alcohol generally, right? And we all know that there's a lot of, you know, negative aspects that come with alcohol use. And we're, we are seeing that, um, cannabis doesn't have you running out the house saying, let's commit a lot of crimes. Cannabis usually says life is not bad. And, you know, you kind of are more in a Zen state than a aggravated, agitated, violent state that, um, alcohol often will cause or other drugs for that matter. Well, before we plug the hell out of uh, where people can find you and find your book and find all of the other communication and media that you have, what's one last thing you'd like people to know about cannabis and its use, whether medically, recreationally, or even just from a financial standpoint? Sure. So, I mean, we're really at this 
you know, the beginning of this green, well, not the beginning, but in the midst of this green rush. And it is a, you know, business aspect. It is a cultural aspect. It's a medicinal aspect that we're all, you know, and depending on who you are, you're, you're in every aspect of this, right? And so in general, I, I would really say to a very broad audience that consider you've been taught to think of it a certain way and to question and, uh, you know, rethink what cannabis actually is. And that as we move forward and with research and exposure, um, we're really going to learn that this is an option that we should have had all a long time ago. And to not judge your grandson or your nephew or niece um, for utilizing it and see it as an option that might actually be keeping them in a safer place than if they were using other substances. Well, thank you so much for educating us. Honestly, I, I learned a lot through this conversation, but also in sharing something that you've put so many years and so much time and energy into uh, for yourself, but for the betterment of other people. So it's fantastic. And this, I'm I'm urging people to go out and vote. And if you mm -hmm. disagree with what we're saying, that's fine too. Use your voice. But yeah. the data suggests everything that we've shared today and more that the positives far, far outweigh any of the negatives that come along with it. And, and if you think about somebody you love in pain and there's a way to treat them, I know there is no amount of crossing lines that you're not willing to do because you want them to be healthy and happy and at least pain-free. And so there's so many options that uh, we just haven't been able to do because of some kind of marketing scam or political agenda and i think it's time we all move past that so we're smarter can, than that now right like we should we'll we, find out with the vote i they say that uh the majority it's the older generation who can't get past it um but you know if we go back into like if we go into the louvre and like add like some joints and some of the paintings maybe they'll think it's like okay it is tradition okay where can people find you and your uh media definitely on social media i'm dr bridget md pretty much on every platform. And so that is social media. I do some Instagram lives um, and you can kind of keep up with me there. My website is drbridgetmd.com. And if you have questions, um, go to info at drbridgetmd. Uh, are you still taking new patients in Ohio and, and elsewhere? And, and Michigan right now. So yeah. I bet Michigan's doing pretty well for you. Yeah, it, it's a different, um, you know, my focus, I always look at, I don't charge people for cards. I charge people for my medical consultation. Cards are just an administrative, you know, duty. And so when people are looking for help, I, I have, um, you know, I work with a lot of people to really make their lives better, I hope. So. Well, thank you, Dr. Bridget. We hope that we get some of our listeners to visit your website, get your book, or at least maybe even, you know, bend your ear and ask for some suggestions. And we will see how this goes. And if the vote passes, maybe we'll be collaborating on the next big weed podcast. I don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. We just went there. Now you can go to thegoingtherepodcast.com for links to all the podcast platforms, our socials, and of course, YouTube. While you're at it, give us a rating, share with a friend, and subscribe. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Joe Cali and Bobby Thomas.